Hi folks, this is Pastor Paul Frick speaking to you from my church office here at Liberty Baptist Church. Uh, a little bit different background today. I uh, thought a change of scenery would be a good thing. So um, I'm sitting actually at my little conference table here in my office. And I'm uh, pleased to be sharing with you the Red Sea rules. And we're looking at rule number nine right now. And we're looking at uh, Exodus chapter 14, verses 30 and 31. So you may want to go ahead and, and turn in your Bibles to those two verses. And while you're doing that, I'm going to read rules one through eight and then read rule nine. Rule one, realize that God means for you to be where you are. Rule number two, be more concerned for God's glory than for your relief. Rule three, acknowledge your enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. Rule four, pray. Rule five, stay calm and confident and give God time to work. Got to be patient. Got to let God give him room maneuver. Don't do something that then preempts or prevents him from doing something on your behalf. Okay? Let the Lord handle it. Then number six, when unsure, take the next step by faith as directed by God. Rule number seven, envision God's enveloping presence. Rule number eight, trust God to deliver in his own unique way. And you could even add in his own uh, unique, miraculous way. And then here we are, rule nine. View your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. Okay, so we're going through different events in our lives. God's in them all. God can work in them all. God can bless through them all. God can teach us through them all, you know, fill in the blank. So what's what you're going through now may seem really bad. This is never, you know, we've never been through anything like this. Chances are God's going to prepare you for an even greater challenge. So view your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. And the whole premise is that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we need to remember that. Okay, Exodus 14, verse 30. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Now what can happen is we can look at the people of Israel and look at their circumstance and we can imagine that they should have had more faith. They should have uh, trusted the Lord more than they did. But we know that there was a lot of murmuring. There was a lot of looking back at their past slavery and they idolized it. And, and people do that. They look back on the past and there's something about the, the way human memory is that we forget how bad things are. And sometimes the present pain that we're in can drown out uh, how painful a past situation was. And it can also drown out our vision of what God's wanting to do in our lives now and in the days ahead. So once uh, they saw all these Egyptians, these soldiers that were dead on the seashore there of the Red Sea, we're told that they saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So they, they recognized this was not happenstance. This, is some, this isn't something that we created. It's something that God did. So, as, in other words, as a result of that, the people feared the Lord, and then they believed the Lord, believed in his promises, and it says his servant Moses. In other words, they understood that God uh, was using Moses, that God had called Moses, and even though 
at times they were angry with Moses. Uh, they, they recognized that indeed Moses was called by God to lead them. So one of the things that um, I wanted to kind of point out was a, a kind of a parallel between Rule 9 and some teaching of Henry Blackaby, Experiencing God. I hope if you've not read that, I hope you would do that. There are seven realities of experiencing God, and that's not our next study, but that might be a good one to do later on. Um, but of these seven realities, the fifth reality is the one I wanted to talk about a little bit. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. In our spiritual development, there are going to be situations where we're going to have to believe God and then act in accordance to what he's telling us to do. And that will be our crisis. Is this the right thing to do? Did I understand what God wanted me to do? How is this going to work? All these questions that we have. And what we have to understand is that crisis is a test for us, a test that God wants us to pass. God's not putting a test out there so that we'll fail and disappoint him. He's putting a test out there so that then he could have an opportunity to glorify himself. And as you uh, believe, have faith, and then act on that belief, then God is able to do great things in our lives. So I wanted to uh, look at uh, two incidents in the Old Testament where there was a crisis of belief and that they, uh, the people of Israel had to do what God told them to do uh, in order to have victory. So first example is Joshua chapter 6. And you may remember this as when the walls of Jericho fell down. And, and I think that we have heard the story so much that we forget how, um, how crazy, that's a good word, how crazy this seemed to be to do this. Okay? So when the people of Israel surrounded Jericho, what action was required. Okay, we're going to read it starting verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel, none of them went out and none came in. So in other words, the people of Israel, they're already in the promised land now. Joshua's leading them and they have surrounded the city of Jericho. Jericho is a beautiful city. It's, um, it's just west of the Jordan River. Uh, city of Palms is what it's called, and um, it's um, one of the oldest cities uh, known in human history. And uh, because of its location near the Jordan River, they, uh, they, they had a good water supply, and being, uh, being below sea level, uh, it actually made for a milder climate, and it's a, it's a beautiful place to visit. And yes, there are palm trees all over the place. So they, the people of Israel, back, to, uh, back then, <laughs> um, the, the city of Jericho had been surrounded. It's called a, a siege. That's what you do. It's, part, it's a warfare tactic. Instead of fighting a city, uh, if they have strong defenses, what you do is you just surround them and then you cut off all their supplies. And so this is what we're told in verse one, that none went out, none came in. So um, verse two, and the Lord said to Jericho, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. Now, now here's what they're supposed to do. You shall march around the city, all you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. Okay? So, uh, 
And they've got the seven priests who bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. So they're the ark and the men, they're just parading around Jericho. And they make one circuit around and then they wait till day two, day three, day four. They get to day seven. This is what they're told to do. Verse four, but the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. The priest shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, the, all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the city, the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So Joshua, instead of saying, now, God, that seems a little ridiculous. Uh, here we are, we're this great army. We have surrounded this city. They are uh, recognizing that we have them right where we want them. And then what we're going to do is we're going to march around the city one time for six times. Then the seventh day, we're going to do it seven times. But this was the only way that God was going to allow them to conquer Jericho because they would be able to look back on this event and they would recognize, I didn't do this. I didn't make this happen. This is a result of God's miraculous power and God's doing this to build their faith for the future. And of course, we know that this, this, the walls fell down and then um, the people of Israel had a great victory over a city that probably the ancient military strategists would say, there's no way that you can conquer Jericho, but they were able to do it because of God. And then one other, one other time, and it, it's, this is kind of the reverse. This is what I like about it. Okay. Uh, it's the reverse of Jericho. Second Chronicles 32, and we're going to pick up in verse 15 and go through verse 23. Okay, let me turn to there, and then I want to talk a little bit about, about this situation. It's pretty neat because what's happened is that Sennacherib, who was a very powerful uh, king, and um, he had come to personally... Uh, oversee the takeover uh, of Jerusalem. And so here he is, this great Assyrian king, and they have laid siege on Jerusalem, okay? So when we're at Jericho, the people of Israel surrounded Jericho, and they won that battle because the Lord was fighting the battle for them. Here we have a situation, and I'm, in fact, I'm going to read verse 9. After this, uh, they had um, they had tried to talk King Hezekiah into going ahead and giving up, but he didn't. So it says, after this, a Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem. But he and all the forces with him laid siege against Lachish, which was another city close to Jerusalem. To Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all Judah who were in Jerusalem, saying, so this is the message. Thus says Sennacherib, king of Syria, in what do you trust that you remain under siege in Jerusalem? Does not Hezekiah persuade you to give uh, yourselves over to, to, to die by famine and by thirst, saying the Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria. So mocking uh, Hezekiah's faith in God, mocking God himself. And uh, let me go on, because th this is really good leading up to verses, verses 15 through 23. And uh, it says, uh, has not uh, the same Hezekiah taken away his high places, his altars, and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, you shall worship before one altar and burn incense on it, which he did. But Hezekiah was doing that in loyalty to God. 
Hezekiah, I mean, uh, Sennacherib was looking at it as a pagan. Well, you, uh, Hezekiah took away all of these altars that you had all over the country and telling everyone to come to Jerusalem to worship. And uh, so, I'm gonna, and so I'm going to go on here, verse 13. Do you not know that I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands? You know, we're, we're mighty, right? Were the gods of the nations of those lands in any way able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Okay, so what this is, Sennacherib is reflecting the, the paganistic and a universal, if you will, a, a universal understanding that uh, there were many gods and gods were in charge of territories and you needed to be careful if you got outside of your territory where your God was because you would be defenseless. A failure to understand that the God who created the earth is everywhere, is all powerful. He's not limited by place or by time. But this is one of the reasons that God is going to give Hezekiah a victory here because He's, God's wanting to make a statement about who he is and what his nature is and what happens to those who defy him. So there's, there's, there, it's not only just about the victory here. It's not only about rescuing God's people. It is about making a statement about who is the true God, who is the one true God, and that uh, God uses these miraculous events as a way of, of trying to communicate to these pagans that your God is not real, okay? Because when you go back to Egypt, it's the Egyptian God against Yahweh God, right? When you look at Jericho, uh, it's the gods of, uh, of Baal and the gods of the promised land against the God who made the land and who promised the land to Israel. Here you have a a pagan king who uh, he's he's saying, you know, my gods have helped me. So um, verse 14, so who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people from my hand that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand? Now, therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or persuade you like this and do not believe him. For, now listen to this, for no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my fathers. And they did. They made many raids into Israel and uh, despoiled the people of Israel many times. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? Okay. So, um, this is a theological battle as well as a military battle. Verse 16, Therefore his servant spoke against the Lord God and his servant Hezekiah. Kind of like with Moses. Uh, when a leader is following God, when you speak against what that leader is doing in God's name, hey, guess what? You're speaking against God too. And that tells us a lot about authority in the church authority in our families. If you're an authority figure, it isn't that what you say goes or what you say has to be right. It's that you are seeking to be right by following God's will and being an example and a model of what it means to be under authority. If you have people who are under you, you're supposed to lead them in the right way just as God's going to lead you in the right way as you understand what God's will is and lead in accordance to God's will. I'm getting on a whole bunch of extra stuff, but hey, no charge, all right? So uh, verse 17, he also wrote letters to revile the Lord God. I mean, he not only said it, now he's writing letters. <laughs> to revile the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, as the gods of the nations of other lands 
have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. Then they called out with a loud voice in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten them and trouble them that they might take the city, speaking in the Hebrew language so that they could understand their message of a ridicule of who God is and ridicule of following what God wants them to do. And here again, we're talking about we uh, have, if we're going to join God in his work, it's going to lead us to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. So, so that's what happened. So um, verse 19, and they spoke against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth the work of men's hands, in other words, the idols, all these other gods that he defeated, uh, they were, were pagan gods that uh, they had images and they had temples built by man. It was uh, pagan worship. It wasn't God Yahweh. Now, because of this, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried out to heaven, which is what we always ought to do. That is appropriate when we are faced with a crisis. And look what happened as a result of this. Then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader, and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned shamefaced to his own land. This is Sennacherib. And when he got into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with the sword there. Thus, the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others and guided them on every side. And many brought gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. So their main action is kind of interesting Hezekiah and Isaiah, was they prayed and they cried out. They had this uh, deep trust in God and asking for God's intervention. I want to share a story that uh, Robert Morgan has in his book, uh, The Red Sea Rules. And it tells about how he had heard Southern Baptist pastor John Bassanio, he was pastor in Houston, Texas, described the time when his daughter, who was about five years old at the time, asked for, for a dollhouse. Well, he nodded and promised to build her one and then returned to his book. Typical of us pastors, I'm afraid. But glancing out the window, he saw the girl, arms crammed with dishes and dolls, making trip after trip until she had a big pile in the yard. So John Bassanio asked his wife, uh, what was the daughter doing? And this is what the wife said. Oh, you promised to build her a dollhouse and she believes you. She's just getting ready for it. So John Bassano tossed aside that book, raced to the lumber yard for supplies and quickly built that little girl a dollhouse. Why? It was her simple childlike faith in his promise. So, if we could have a simple childlike faith in the promises that God gives us, we would be amazed at how quickly and how powerfully God will act on our behalf. Not because we ask it, but because we are believing in the promise that he's made to us. We didn't extort that promise from God, whatever situation we're in, but rather uh, it is a promise that God makes to calm our fears and to help us to deal with uh, the, the various challenges that we face in life. So rule nine, view your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. So that way we get our present crisis in perspective. God's helped us in the past. God's going to help us now. And boy, how is he going to help us in the future? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, dear God, we know that your deepest 
heart's desire for us is that we would grow in our faith towards you. And so, Lord, as we face new challenges every day and sometimes challenges that are worldwide, like this pandemic that we're in right now, Lord, continue to give us faith, draw us to you. And we know, Heavenly Father, there are times that as we join your work, that it's going to lead to a crisis of belief where it will require of us faith and action. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to meet uh, those, uh, those crises with faith in you and an action that trusts in you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks for joining me. And then next week, Rule 10, and then we're going to go to another study. God bless.